Nice to, nice to see all of you. Thank you for, for uh, coming tonight. So I, I have to say, uh, this, is, this event and this event, uh, probably the quintessential, for instance, of why we do what we do, like what's going on. And, and uh, I think it, it's pretty clear Florencia invented something and it's, it's a unique voice, and an idiosyncratic voice, and a personal voice. Um, but I wanted to say something first. Uh, uh, many of you know Joe Rosa, who um, claims to be the director of the uh, gallery at the University of uh, Michigan. And, and right, <laughs> as long as it doesn't bounce. And so we, ha we have him to acknowledge uh, for the presence of, of uh, Florencia's um, project, which she said was a table. Um, so maybe we, maybe we find out if that's true or not. But I wanted to thank Joe, and I, I did have a question to him, which, which I'd like to start with, which I asked him uh, a little while ago. And it has to do with the mission, since SciArc also has a gallery and, and used in a somewhat different way. Uh, is he on a mission in terms of what he commissions, in terms of the uh, exhibitions that he supports? In other words, is there a very particular advocacy that belongs to um, I guess before Chicago Art Institute and now the University of Michigan and a number of places you've been. How would you describe what you do, why you do it, what motivates you in terms of, of uh, uh, sponsoring exhibitions? That's a long question, um, but a good one. Um, I'll go reverse, and I'll come to Florencia later, in that um, evolution. The interest in coming out of being a, an A&D person is looking at progressive thinking, and we just refer to the SciArc Gallery. What's nice about the lineup of all the shows that have happened here, devoid of one's age, they're all progressive works, where senior avant-garde people usher in the younger generation and collectively both push the envelope. Museums don't always have that. And most of the people who've been in my exhibits as emerging talents have come out, like there are a lot of them are here, they come out of, LA, they come out of this kind of way of thinking, which comes out of the school. So going from being a curator of a department to being a curator of a museum, the objective is, is to kind of push the envelope from all the art disciplines. So when it came to thinking about architecture, as I said to Eric earlier, the motto for us is people equate a museum with being a normal environment to look at things that you don't understand. So it's safe to be, not know what the hell you're looking at. So therefore, the architecture should push the envelope of how one's thinking to raise those questions and not look normative. So with Florencia, the idea was to showcase her work as a solo artist, because the glass gallery that we just showed, we do that with a variety of different artists, whether they're contemporary artists who are coming out of Korea. And no one really knows what the medium is of the artist who's in the gallery. So when I brought Florencia forward to do the show, and I said she's going to do a table, everyone thought it was going to be a table. But when the drawings came in, and then we realized what was being shipped, everyone got very excited because it was not a table. It spoke to a sense of scalelessness, that it could be a table, it could be a city plan, it could be a ring. And that helped push the envelope within the museum, even to the simple wall text, that when someone looks at the table and notices these rings, these different objects, that it kind of all folds together and it raises questions about architecture. And having the School of Architecture of Michigan, which is a progressive uh, school, it's a good thing to showcase pushing the envelope since we have students on campus. So there is a mission to it. But there's, you know, there's fewer and fewer people that are aesthetically inclined in pushing the envelope and more socio-ecologically based, which I don't really particularly find interesting because it doesn't really work in the art world. So. One um, parenthetical response to that, I think what we do <clears throat> at SciArc is to try very hard not to look at work in terms of how 
often it's characterized as this generation or that generation. And I know that's, that's an easy handle to put on work or groups of people, but really to try to, to differentiate, not so much in terms of age, uh, but in terms of content or in terms of, of uh, strategy. And just to, to give Florencia a shot, since it's her shot, uh, and we, we started um, by, by calling this a table. I, I mean, I think I want to get to, at a certain point, what, what I think Florencia is doing, which um, would be the opposite in a certain way of what we come, or I think what Joe described as progressive, that it's an attack on almost everything everybody else in the room does. That, that, that it's, it's a very different kind of voice. I mean, the nature of the attack and, what, what, and the criticism and what it actually means, so maybe we, we get to that. Um, I think we should. But to start, to start off, it was described as a table. And, and I think Joe said, you know, it's a table, so everybody's not so excited. And then they saw what it was, and they got very excited. Between the not so excited and the very excited, the question is, did the table get lost? How is this a table? What makes it a table? I knew that question was coming from you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess I We'd do something else. <laughs> uh, uh, no, first I wanted to thank Eric for bringing the table back, the uh, 1,000 pounds table. Um, and for Joe, of course, continue support uh, in uh, UMA and also at the Chicago Art Institute. The two objects that are on the wall, so it's not only about the table, are two, it's a piece of a much larger uh, exhibition that was uh, featured 2012. No, I was going back. <laughs> oh my God, long time ago. 2010, um, under uh, Joe's curatorial um, leadership at the Chicago Art Institute. And it was a, a much larger, that was a wall, I would say. This is a kind of horizontal plane. And so two of the objects are in display here. Um, and I think that, I mean, uh, Maybe my, my guess would be to kind of avoid the table question uh, in a way because it's, uh, when Joe uh, called me to do this show, the idea was to do like a collection, a display of the collection of objects. And, and, he, and he wanted to really show uh, a kind of a range that went from much earlier pieces to newer ones. So in a, in a little bit, it, it really builds up a kind of much larger narrative uh, so there are a few projects that were older projects, newer ones, and then he wanted one, one um, he commissioned along with kind of displaying uh, other projects, he also wanted to commission a piece. And the idea at the beginning was uh, really to display these objects in pedestals. So I would say that this more than a table, this is a kind of bunch of pedestals, you know, the kind of legs display that. And, and also was a, an idea of moving from the kind of vertical wall of uh, Chicago with the, uh, with the kind of 2D map uh, into a kind of horizontal pla plane. And, uh, and, you know, so in a way, like the simple version of mentioning it would be like a table, but actually it's a, it's a kind of a large, it's a large drawing. And, and some of the elements that were present there uh, in terms of a study, not only on geometry, but also materiality, is this idea of finding kind of a new material to investigate. The same graphics that are just like a fresco painting on Cronopius, now it became a, a, a kind of an advance in a, in a particular materiality. In this case, these are ceramic tiles that are printing, printed digitally. So it, it becomes a kind of a study on something uh, more tectonic, let's say. So uh, maybe, maybe the nomenclature then is superfluous. Maybe it doesn't matter. But if you call it a table, and there should be chairs, and people should pull up, and they should, in other words, it's not a table operationally. I, probably the only thing that makes it a table is that, there, that it operates at a certain elevation. 
Okay. And there are things sitting on it. So it could be a platform or a counter or any of those, right? Mm -hmm. So well, it also grows out of museum culture. Because in the museum culture, there's bonnets, there's there's vitrines, there's kind of a, vo a normative vocabulary of furniture in a gallery space. So for us, the idea was, in first communicating it, was you asked her for a table. No, I asked her for a table. I told her we had a variety of things in the room, and we needed however she wanted to handle it. Could have, originally we thought maybe a floor piece she was thinking. Rex was going to attack a surface that she had not yet. So in this concept, when she came back with it, was doing a horizontal surface that had the vitrines on it. That kind of blurs the boundaries between bonnets floating in a room to a table surface, a horizontal surface. So we refer to it as a table. And then everyone at the museum felt comfortable that this horizontal surface that was going to be some sort of a table, maybe a Martin Kippenberg kind of table with things stuck on little, you know, for, you know, cylinders. And then when this came in, they were like, well, that's not really a table. It's, what is it? Because it has a top and has sides. It can be read in two different ways. So within the museum, it, it has, leg. the way it has legs, it has too. It has legs that are far more curvaceous than a lot of other aspects of it. So in elevation, when you see it in the windows from the museum, it collapses. You get this strong black datum from which these curvilinear forms come down to the floor with these transparent dome-like shapes until you get closer to the window and you look in and your perspective shifts. You read the top of color that actually flows onto the other wall pieces. So it's interesting in that sense. Could you flip it upside down, for instance, and hang it from the legs? If you could, conceptually, if you have enough money to. Well, you might see it. I mean, if, if, yeah. if, if the issue is to evaluate the surfaces, understand the pieces, I mean, the question is, I mean, somebody could say, if, I think if I made a table and somebody said, could you flip it upside down? And I would say, no. Because I made this, so now if, if, if the question is how malleable is the idea in terms of how you show it, that's all. I mean, you say yes, I no. I think it becomes a table in the sense it mixes the pieces together, so you kind of get a meta narrative of her history of making on top of a surface that represents one of her most recent ways of thinking. But if devoid of its finishes, but this is uh, this is so kind of. Uh, it could be something completely other academic in a way, as, in, as, a, as, a, as opposed to something which is more poignant and more tangible as an effect. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the narrative? What's the intention? What's, what's, when we're done, we walk in the gallery and we saw it and then we go somewhere else. Now what do we know when we came in that we didn't know before? I mean, I can tell you, but I, you, I think I know, actually. I think it's a secret, actually. In fact, I think the whole thing is a camouflage, actually. I think it's, it's about something very different, which is actually quite appealing to me. Um, but from your point of view, I mean, what are you telling us? What should I know when I saw this? What should I well, learn? I, I think that you know some of the things that we were talking the other day that come to play, you know, when, um, and a, another thing that it's it has to do with you know with the, in a way the, combination of certain studies that are happening, you know, within the, the different works that are displayed, and also the fact that it became. Your works an, or other people's. Work? Well, it was a kind. It's a collection of objects that are, you know. But is it a that discussion about what you do, or is it a discussion about what you do vis-a-vis -vis what, what other people do? Well, I, you can open that discussion as well. I think that what well, is present, what present, open, there's no combination. It? What actually all the objects, the, the, there are different objects that I've done in the last ten years. So, so it's a kind of, uh, in a way, each one of them, you know, kind of talks about a particular moment in time within those ten years. You know, what could be but what, done. But if you don't know that, in other yes. words, you need a, a, a catalog in you order need a to know that. Yeah. <laughs> a catalog. But if, a he's, catalog. If, he's, if Joe is sick that day, you, we're in trouble. <laughs> I went in trouble. That's uh, what we're in trouble. No, but uh, the way that, you know, yes. Well, uh, let me ask you something else about the table. The floor in this room is cockeyed. I think Stephanie, <laughs> Stephanie can tell you that. 
Therefore, what operates conventionally as a table couldn't operate as a table. So the pieces that are contiguous actually aren't contiguous in the sense that they fit. They go up and down. Mm -hmm. That okay? Yes. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be like, it's this, level well, everything I, off, I, I, or, I or you can't show it. I think that I, the, 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 I think that we're getting, or I'm getting in trouble with the the fact that it's the, the its name is a table. If I you know if it had a different yeah. name, I mean though the Canopies have a name that you cannot fight. No, but with how that. Per, how precise but are the obligations? Well, it doesn't of the have it doesn't have an obligation to the functionality of the object. There's no chairs ever been chairs surrounding it to be to use. To, you, to be in use as a table. So then that means that the, 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 the table has that, you know, a little bit what Joe was talking about what happened in the museum, has that kind of agility to have a certain proximity as something that you can recognize as an object, but it doesn't have any of the requirements that a, a highly detailed product design would need. But I mean, for instance, if we said, okay, that's okay, the, the, the rose piece and the blue piece, contiguous and fit as a plan, don't fit as a section. Therefore, why don't we put the pieces at different levels and you can read the, the where one piece starts and the other. Is, is that okay? It's okay? So. No? I don't think so, because in many ways it's almost like a drawing. It's a horizontal drawing, not that different than the wall works, which have varying depths and dimensions. So I mean, in many ways, it's the slight nuances of the different shifts of the data. But, but I, think, I think that if you look at the, the walls, the, the two that are in the wall, that it, they belong to a much larger drawing. And the, the drawing, you know, for matters of different reasons, you know, they're traveling. And there's, there, there were eight of them, and two made it here. Other ones are distributed in different collections. So they were able, you know, they were separated as parts. You know, you could read them as individual objects. You could read them in their totality of their background as a drawing, and they all belong within the, 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 an idea of representation. Similar thing would be with the, with the table. It would not lose, because it really works as a drawing. It could be separated. Three parts right now are displayed here. Uh, you could separate them or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you could present one part in. So, so that's why it doesn't have, if you had a very specific functionality, a missing leg would make it fall, or a missing part would make it. Well, maybe a missing leg wouldn't make it fall if you shoved the pieces up against each other. So if you were dealing with the issues the of structure which, yeah. or support, which maybe. Uh, also, but they the, work, yeah. The, mass, like the, the overall outline of, the ta as this, of this horizontal surface, if you want to call it from now on, the Uma horizontal surface, um, is somewhat predicated on the square gallery that it was in. So in other words, like the overall perimeter of this is designed intentionally within our gallery space, which was a big square. So the kind of, if our space was longer and narrower, I'm sure this would have been a different configuration. Would it? Yes. Yeah. But the other thing we should be fun to So it's made for the gallery. It's made yes. for the museum, exactly. That's what it was commissioned. But you allowed it to come into a very different space. Mm -hmm. Right, because we gave it back to the audience. Which is always let me, right thing to do. Okay. Unless you're, let me, you, let me go then. you give it to them. You're never gonna right. But what about color? I mean, one thing no, we about this, we we're get getting to the color. Oh, yeah. We, is that number three? Can, we move on from that. Don't thing. read anything down here. It's just, you can't read that. Because it doesn't work that way. Um, when, we, when we talked about this the other day, and you said something like, it's a puzzle. Remember when you said that? Yeah. I regret it. I mean, you regret it? <laughs> I mean, if you, it's interesting when you look at a puzzle, like a kid's puzzle, or even a, a very sophisticated, very complicated puzzle, which has a perimeter a little bit like what Joe described in the sense that almost always, but not always, the perimeter or the edge of the puzzle is utterly different from the shape of the pieces. But one of the ways you do a puzzle like that there's I had you doing one the other day. I mean, what she did is she gets the edge, mm -hmm. gets the edge because you have that straight edge, and you make it, and then, and then you work in. But in your case, it's it, unless you want to say that the that the edge of the puzzle is the room, and maybe you're saying mm -hmm. that that the pieces don't don't the pieces are on the outside the same as the pieces are on the inside. 
So, I mean, a couple of things. Is it a puzzle with pieces missing, or is it a different kind of puzzle? And why should it be a puzzle anyway? In other words, what are we, if it's a puzzle, it's a puzzle, and what are we puzzling over? What's the mystery? You know what I mean? I, I, I think that would, something that it's, I mean, I, I would like to always go back to the notion of the drawing, you know, like how a particular geometry can start to kind of build up um, the form. And in a way, what is interesting, I find geometrically of a puzzle is it starts to kind of build up uh, a logic, or, or kind of multiple readings onto one single system. You know, you have the reading of the pieces, how they're cut. You have the reading of the image that is kind of imposed onto it. Uh, you have the reading of the outer profile. You have the different, you know, the, the edge uh, pieces are straight on one side. This, but is, not, they, so this, this like, is not what, what, what I'm looking for. I mean, if you had a puzzle and you're trying to figure out how to put it together, and what makes it challenging is that you have all these odd pieces, odd in a fairly consistent way, you know, this sort of a section through a bell pepper or something, you know, these kind of puzzle-looking pieces. And you don't know where to put them. So you have to figure it out mm -hmm. by color, and you associate with color and shape and, and the cut and so on. Would it have made more sense to, to put the pieces out on the floor not together in very different places, and then to see whether part of the intellectual game is to understand how they might go together, or maybe to make something which looks like a puzzle from different puzzles and the pieces don't go together at all. So, so if, if you look at it as a puzzle in a, in a conceptual way, like what does it mean to make something? Maybe if, if you look around, I don't know, looking around, if you look at the light and the pieces of the light, you know, the, the, uh, the bulbs or the grills or whatever, there's, there's a kind of operational logic to those pieces, whether, whether, whether you like it or not. And, and the question is, in making a piece like this, is there some kind of logic to putting the elements together that would allow you to conclude that's the way it should fit? Or is that, is that something you don't help anybody with? Because you, you made a puzzle and put it all together, so we don't have anything to do anymore. But one thing, I would say it's a puzzle where it's not a puzzle. Because when you refer to systems of assembly, with her later, which is a weird point, her most recent architectural projects, there's a whole aspect of the works about gay congruent forms coming together and congruent typologies. So it's not about things actually working together, but almost juxtaposing. So it's not about a smooth system of assembly, which is why I think if this came to me as a proposal from Florence that it was a rectangle with all these, you know, <coughs> compound curves which look very much like a Hokusai Japanese print, it wouldn't be interesting because for me, after you know writing the essay and looking more at the work and looking at the linear evolution of her thinking from her first installation here, Pulse, to this, there is a trajectory of the work that led itself to this kind of juxtaposition, incongruent forms coming together that shouldn't be smooth and shouldn't be seamless, almost layered in a way that could appear puzzle-like. Because puzzles are about confusion and order once you assemble it, right? You look at things, you can't tell what they are, you identify the easiest form of the puzzle, which is the perimeter, you then go for more complex. But in a, in a, in a conceptual way, a puzzle is, I mean, there's something either not quite clear, enigmatic, but the implication is if you're clever enough, I mean, remember that Rubik's thing and all of that, that ultimately you can, yeah. you can, you can put it together. So all I'm saying is if, if that's part of this discussion, it's certainly not all of it, then is the idea to put it together in order to show that it works, or is the idea to leave it apart and let the, the, the intellectual construction of the person who looks at it understand? And I think that's, that's, as a postulate, it's a very different hypothesis, actually, to show the pieces together or to show, or, or to show, show the pieces separate. So this, is, this, was, this was the question. Okay, um, uh, let, me, let me ask you something else because I think you get a lot of, a lot of this 
um, as, as a response that, that it's, I think when we were talking, and I'm not sure everybody will know this, but the, the, the cartoon, the, the yellow submarine cartoon with sort of bumpy characters and blue meanies and certain kinds of colors and, and, and happy and sad and all of that. And there's an emotive quality that, that and, and maybe particularly children would respond to, but uh, certainly not only children, uh, if there's some hope for the adults too, but the but the but the 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 mood, the tone of the thing, I don't think this is really so. But I think it might suggest, at least superficially, those kinds of 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 uh, it's simple, it's bright, it encourages you be happy, be cute. You know things like that. Is that is that a uh, an interpretation of of the work that you would you or you don't like that? No, no. I think I, and I think it's an interesting example that instead of like you're talking about some Pixar movie or something that is literally for kids, or you're mentioning way before Pixar. you're mixing you you mentioning something that it's like you know it's actually um, more it was you know it was a kind of um, a quite interesting moment in history. Where, you know, cartoons or figures or you know, there's a, there's a, even you would see you know within that time similar attitude towards uh, posters and you know mm. and, and you know graphics graphics um, which I think you know so it has some of that kind of quality of like somehow bringing things from the everyday life uh, towards. Um, uh, kind of an, an architectural objects or to towards the architectural realm, you know, where, where color always was seen very much as a kind of ornamentation. Um, I think what is interesting is that the way that I, that I see it is not it becomes it, it doesn't become only an ornamentation of a kind of painted surface, but actually it's a kind of possibility of advancing a, a new materiality. You know, I start to kind of look at it uh, for what it can do in terms of all that you said. You know, it becomes a, a, um, a surface that, that produces uh, a kind of an effect. Uh, it can change the atmosphere. Uh, it can really kind of transform an object, but I think the most it can transform the materiality. One thing that we're saying is that uh, most of these objects have, work as disguise, you know, where the color is a disguise to what they truly are. In this case, if the, the table is made out of uh, wood, uh, it's painted and it's color coded, uh, so it seems as if there's a lot of parts when actually it's all like assembled by really large chunks. Well, I mean, just just to be basic, is it supposed to make me happy? Well, is, I, that, is that an intention of the table, the yeah. colors and the use of the colors? But I would say it would make you happy if you probably liked Andy Warhol or part, part, part the, the layer, which I think renders Florencia different than maybe some others. Or, or the other side of the coin is very common to a generation of progressive thinking, is looking at literature, semiotics, narrative to inform an architectural product or, or making of something, looking outside of architecture, history or literature. That's literature. A lot of this has to do with Warhol and pop art colors. And with some other projects, you get brutalism mixed in. So what happens is, I don't think, they're not gratuitous. They're intentionally constructed using a narrative outside of the discipline of the architecture that informs it. So it's not the Beatles, but it's most likely literature back there or an art movement that is informing it. You're saying it's gratuitous or No, not? it's not gratuitous. So just say it's colors that are ha happy. Well, that's subjective and gratuitous, but if there's a narrative that one applies to it as their lens, I don't know if I know what that word means. Mean, my definition of gratuitous would be motiveless. Yes. That it that it but might be an ins it might be an instinct, but but an instinct, a visceral instinct, which wouldn't mean it 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 doesn't it may not fit in a conventional architectural discourse. I'm not sure this mm -hmm. does, but um, to say okay, cheer up, sucker, and if you if you're having trouble, take a look at this. You know, maybe you put it in a psychiatrist's office or something. I don't know. You or might or have some, more patients. Or you bought the Jeff Koons for sixty-one million. I mean, you know. No. <laughs> same kind of. But I do think I do think that they can induce uh, induce uh, a mood. I mean, one thing that I, I always use as a reference, uh, 
mostly starting with the much earlier project was a, was a movie by Sofia Coppola called uh, Maria Antonietta. And the way that it's, it was interesting because it was, even if it was a historical piece, it, has, it had nothing of historical. It was almost like playing a movie about teenager kids. Um, and the way that she treated the custom design um, was to, instead of looking at, again, the historical reference of where it came from, uh, actually she started to kind of look at the notion of uh, personality and mood. So she treated every moment of, uh, Maria Antoinette with a different color palette. So the earlier, when she comes from Austria and so on, are like earth tones. When she moves onto her teenager mode, uh, she looks at pastries and, and, and she looks at very cheerful colors. And then at the end, before um, her end, uh, they go back to the traditional French colors of dressing. So, they, but, so but are, it was interesting because she tried to match the mood of uh, the character, the main character right. in the movie, with the uh, ambience. But you know, I, I remember walking around the, um, the High Court building in Chandigarh a few years ago, and the pieces are painted. And if you read the, the Le Corbusier exegesis, the green stands for something, and the red stands for something. There are colors that have certain meanings in certain cultures, I don't think that, that I think this, this contemporary culture is too fragmented for that. So if it's an attempt to find colors that are associated with moods, then what you're really saying is each piece is a different mood. If, if, if that's what you're associating with a film, if each piece is a different mood, I'm not sure anybody would read each color, in other words, blue means, I don't know what, peace or something. And, and, uh, but whether that's something which we share or a few people share, but you're saying that the colors are associated with moods. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think they so can what be are, what are the, So there are three colors, so what are the three moods? What would the three moods be? I was putting that as a reference of the, you know, that how I think that using color beyond the simple materiality of any object is, is a way of embedding an object with multiple. But uh, uh, right, right, right. It, it, what, what, so that would be, so you know, so it's not a one to one, yeah. <clears throat> so it's not a particular, but at least we're saying if you're, <clears throat> what are the yellow guys that the kids watch now? They eat the bananas. Monk, oh, the, the, min the minions. Oh, the minions, yeah. yeah. The minions. <laughs> it's despicable me. <laughs> yeah, despicable me minions. They're fantastic. They're good. I like yeah. so the yellow. Huh? The minions. The minions. Yeah, the yellow guys word. and they go through the... <laughs> it's not a good it, word. Well, it's, but they're soldiers. <laughs> and maybe the association. But, but it, it, they're yellow. Yeah. You know? And, and the question but is... Did they turn purple in the last movie? If you eat the banana or something? I don't know. Something, but, yeah, they turn purple. But I don't know that game, it came but I bad watched, and watched it play ad nauseum. But, but, the, but the colors, I think, could be associated, if you don't want to say this is X and this is Y and this is Z, but they have different connotations, or they could have different connotations. So I was just trying to get at whether there's a particular reason or strategy for making them mm -hmm. what they are, really. There's, there's another thing I want to ask you. We were, and Joe said this a minute ago, that, that there are a number of scales. So it's either scaleless or there are a number of scales represented simultaneously. And I mentioned to you the other day, some of you will know this, a, a book by Jonathan Swift called Gulliver's Travels. And in Gulliver's Travels, um, which is a political satire, I think an 18th century satire, and he goes to, Gulliver goes to a place called Lilliput. And he's the biggest guy and everybody else is tiny. And then he goes to a place called Brobdingnag and he's the smallest guy and everybody is big. And then he goes to a place called the uh, Huanims, and, the, and who, very sophisticated characters who are half horses and half people. And in every context where, where he goes, the, the juxtaposition of what he is as opposed to what the environment is, 
is, is antithetical, and one is antithetical to the other. And <clears throat> the, the question is if this represents different scales, for instance, that it, that it would represent a city plan, you said. You, that, that was one of the things you said. It could be, or I said, I don't, you said, somebody said, it, it could be a city. So the question is, if it's a city, and that's a reading, one reading we get to say, the table would be a reading, the graphics or the surfaces would be a reading, um, what kind of city would it be? In other words, if it's a city plan and it's an advocacy of a particular kind of city or a strategy for a city. So if you say it's all these things, and I was looking at it and it may be that that's so, how do you validate the argument that it's a city? I mean, what kind of city are we looking at? I would say when you think about things being scaleless or scalelessness, which is something that was used as a derogatory term in the 50s to describe uh, Gordon Bunchev's Beinecke Library, which then becomes a term that's been inverted to bigness through Rem Koolhaas as a positive. Within the scalelessness, its scale is only determined when its function hits. So if it is a city, its materiality is going to transform it. If it's a table, its materiality is going to transform it. If it's a dish, if it's a ring, the materiality of its function transforms its scalelessness into a scale of operation. So until it resides within a scale, it's a concept. But I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is if you take this, this piece in, in the foreground and you have that horizontal plane, mm -hmm. which let's say is a surface of a piece of the city, and then you have something which let's say nominally is a building of some kind in the city, or, or a supra building or something, and then you have something inside it which is different altogether. So you have, the, you have the, the, the surface or the plane of the land, and then you have something coming out of the land, and then what's coming out of the land has something entirely different coming out of inside of that. But I, I think, so this is yeah, an artist I, no, city, it's think, not an architect I think, city. I think it's, this, is, this is a design, it's a design uh, point of view, you know, like, and I, I'll bring a few examples that will, um, come back home. But I, I think that for me, in a way, the, for, the, the idea is that there's no such a thing as citiesness, or like there's no such a thing, as the, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a critique to the notion of fixed typologies, or the notion of uh, sight as, as the only source of information to kind of building up uh, a, a design proposal, where actually there's a lot more malleability in the way that you can start to treat uh, drawings or in the way that you can start to work with some uh, design processes. I mean, today when I was walking through your office, um, you know, seeing the, 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 for example, some study models that were either a sandbag that can become a way of slumping glass or like a, a small uh, foam piece torque to create a certain a notion of torsion within geometry. Those things don't have, have nothing to do probably with their original typology or program of certain buildings, you know. So there's not, no such, so it's in a way the idea that things can have multiple scales, that things can work at the flower vase or can work at the scale of a table or could come from ideas of a more kind of literal material investigations or formal investigation of certain objects. I think that that idea that you can really extract geometry from objects and then test them at the at multiple scales. I think what's, what's appealing about it but very different from a conventional logic of explanation of why something is what it is, is, is a mix of pieces that you're not likely to find together. I mean, if these, these are literally vertical, but they're not ruptures because they're pretty pristine. You know, they're the kinds of things you might in a different form find in a chemical mm -hmm. lab, you know? And and but the objects inside of them, you know, if th if this were if this were the uh, University of California at Berkeley horticulture lab, or something, and these were containers, and then what's in the container is some flo uh, some flower, 
that was a crossbred between Bolivia and, and uh, Tanzania or something that nobody would ever know and nobody had, had ever seen. And, and those, those kinds of associations that, that seem very far from a, a conventional um, architectural logic. I, what, I, I wrote this down and I, I just I, I wanted to read it to you because the reason I said I thought the project was a disguise is because the color and the, the sort of happiness quotient of the project is, is, is it's not a, so much a subterfuge, but it, it, it camouflages what arguably the project could be said to be about. Because I wrote this, da I wrote this down that it's, 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 it's anti all these things. It's anti a kind of existential architecture. Like here's a building and go cut your wrists in the parking lot or something like that. You know, the sort of... Um, a kind of. I mean, I don't want to pick on. I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but let's uh, let's pick on the guy who talks to bricks, or something, and and so that would be. Yeah. yeah. So this would be existential architecture, you know, architecture or victory or death, or something. I don't necessarily say that facetiously. I think I actually believe it. But, but, and, and, but this, in a literal sense, I do, but, I, but it, it, it's not so much whether I believe it or not. I think this is an argument for something different. You know, it's an argument against that. Mm -hmm. And whether you say that or not, I think, it, so this, is, this was the first point. It's also anti, the, the current uh, fabrication technology, i.e., 3D printing, for instance. Because when you take, if you look at the pieces, which are clearly 3D prints, and then you look at how they're finished, you know, so somebody sat there, I mean, a 3D print has certain meaning in terms of what you can make and the curvatures and the shapes and all of that. And then somebody sits there for 50 hours and hand paints the thing. So, so this isn't usually, you know, you bang something out or everybody goes home to watch a Laker game and you come back in the morning and you have it and you give it to the client and you're done. And this is a completely different kind of, of, of finishing. Therefore, anti cut your wrists in the parking lot, anti 3D print. I think it's also in terms of the way a lot of people work and understand architecture volumetrically. I think in a certain sense it's anti-spatial or it's aspatial. It's a little more complicated than that. But but it descends in planes. You know, it doesn't descend in, in so the, the the section is always a straight line down. I know the legs are a little bit different, but you know, that that it it really the question of surfaces or descending surfaces is a little bit different than the question of volumes and shapes. And I think in that sense, all of the uses of, of contemporary software or the way it's most often applied is quite different than this. So I would say the spatial strategy as, as an advocacy is completely different than all these guys are doing. Totally different. It's not. It has. It, it has different interests, and and uh, so I, I think I think that needs to be part of what we understand. I think it's also, in my terms, it's anti-structure or anti-construction, in the sense that that I mean, even if you said, okay, this thing, you know, this is a hunk of concrete which has a certain meaning in terms of thickness and depth and legibility. And this is not a very sophisticated piece of construction, but maybe 150 years ago it was, or something. And there isn't anything in this project which is analogous to that. Because if you look at the legs or how it's supported or where it's supported, there really isn't any interest in defining the, the, the mechanism that keeps it from hitting the floor in a way which is illustrative of what it would take minimally or maximally, how you could test it or strain it or measure it. You know, the column's not like this, it's like this. Or the cantilever's not like this, it's 57 miles. So whether that's 
old news or adolescent or whatever it is. But there's not, it's so, in that sense, I would say it's, it's anti, uh, anti-structural. And, and the last thing I would say is it's anti-material. That, it, that for all of, the, uh, all of the contemporary discussions about materiality and new materials and, and, and all of that, uh, in terms of fabrication capabilities and, and, and surfaces and all of that, it's, you make things, I mean like, I don't know whether anybody knows it, you said it's wood. I wasn't sure whether it's wood or it's plastic, but there's tile out there, there's ceramic tile out there. And, and you can see a grid, but I'm not sure you know whether it's tile or what it is, and it's pretty clear when you when you finish a uh, a project like that, that that you're making an effort to dislocate an understanding of material and substitute something which is synthetic, or has a different meaning, or it's your meaning. You know, I don't call wood has to look like wood, and concrete has to look like concrete, and 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 all of those things. So I would, I would say, I think that's the end of the list, anti-existential, anti-3D print, anti-technology, anti-spatial, anti-structural, anti-material. So, and, well, yeah, but anti means pro-something. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think, I think in, in that sense, it's one of the more polemical projects around. And that's, it has nothing to do with being happy which is why I called it a disguise. And I, I don't know whether you, you, you're sympathetic to any of those things just sort of happen, but you never explain the project that way. You don't explain it, you don't write about it, he doesn't write about it, you don't talk about it. But vis-a-vis -vis other things that are going on, I think whether people are sympathetic or interested or supportive, but it clearly takes the discussion in a completely different direction. And in, in, in terms of, of, of historic anal analogies, if you looked at some of the things that Charlie Moore and Venturi were doing, and I don't think it's the same thing, but vis-a-vis -vis what was around at the time and what they came to advocate, I think this is, a, this is a real advocacy, and it ought to be talked about in that way, and not just as it meet the Beatles or something. So I, that, that was my uh, uh, sense of the thing. And I, I, I think that makes it a, a kind of serious, a serious conceptual proposition. It doesn't necessarily make it poetry. It doesn't necessarily make it beautiful in an ethereal sense. But it makes it, it, it raises a lot of questions. And I, it seems to me it has to be talked about. And I think that's really what it's about. And I think that's why it's in the room. Um, um, yes. <laughs> I'm very glad with your comment. Um, I, I think that, I mean, those. Uh, maybe the anti is not a thesis, but the idea that, uh, you know, just going through some of them, the, the idea that it's, it's in between, it's anti-surface, it's in between the line and the surface, you know, it's like it, it never gets to negotiate, that's the work, so you compare it to some of the work, you know, where the surface has become so evident and, and so, uh, uh, you know, larger than life. I think that in a way, it starts to, it, it still deals with, it, it's either very flat, very 2D, or it's, or it's not. And it goes halfway, so it becomes flat at all levels. And I, I would imagine, I, I think that as I see some of them, I mean, if you, I, it, it's anti-structure when we did with um, my partner uh, in you know, my parallel office, Jackie Bloom, who we were working on PS1 not too long ago. Uh, and then we look at a material that is so thin that it, it, it is almost like paper, you know, but it had to stand up for almost 30 feet. Uh, the idea is that it's, it's a structure, it's a super light structure, so it was looking at a new structure, but it was not trying to challenge that, but actually make it disappear. So it was so thin, but it could stand really tall. 
and you know it's a kind of it was a big wall or a big, big drawing so you know so this this was more heavy it's just got more columns so but I mean for instance Wolf was here mm -hmm. Wolf was here the other night yakking about structure and he said something like I'm trying to remember you guys said something like I don't like columns so three columns is uh, better than four and not as good as two or something like that. And, and, but, but behind that uh, kind of sardonic presentation is a very particular interest, a, a very particular interest which explains a lot of what those guys do in terms of preferences and technical decisions and advocacies which they've come to understand as a way of doing what they think is radical architecture. I don't know exactly who they is, but whoever they are. And that, that I'd probably have to include myself in, in to be fair in that, not that we have to be fair, but, but in that group. And when you take a, a kind of, of um, Baroque, uh, Louis XIV, but maybe a little too heavy table leg, and spread it around underneath in, 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 in a way which is almost random, except for the fact, I mean, you don't test it even in the sense that even if you did that and put them all in the middle, you know, but it's, so the, the choice of a support and the position of a support is a position about technique and technology and, and, and structure. It's worth talking about. Because if we were working, or people were working in this way, I think you'd produce very different kinds of buildings. And I have to say, um, are you selling your catalog or giving it? Have people seen the catalog? It's that thing in, in the Mora, what is it? Maribor. Yeah, Maribor. Right, which is a kind of fascinating project. It's, it's the one that I saw that, that, that links all of these discussions mm -hmm. with a very particular housing idea. I mean, that ought to be built. I ought to build five of those things. You know, we ought to be able to find somebody who's willing to do that. But you can see the applicability of this, of this thing, um, and it produces something quite different mm -hmm. and that nobody recognizes. And I, I think like in a lot of cases when you don't recognize it, you tend to associate it with things that you already know and already heard and, mm -hmm. and, and it might be dismissed, which is a danger. I, just, I, I think that it, that it has a lot of, of intellectual content. I don't know whether, whether you could do better as an advocate for that, but maybe you advocate what you want to advocate. It's your project. But uh, I think I think it's it's a special kind of inquiry in that sense, whether it whether the final result matters or not. And uh, oh, yeah. I think yeah, do you want to talk about yeah, it? What's interesting with this piece being here is it kind of goes full circle from her first installation here, and I think it people know more about the work and not the two installations can see this evolution in thinking, which does become more about positioning because when we were doing the show, that project you just mentioned was the last one in the book. We didn't know what this was gonna look like until it arrived, which was exciting and it really speaks to a different sensibility that shows moving beyond the artificial figuration she was doing earlier. But what it does push is that after what you're talking about, which is anti-material because it's interesting that in this day and age in architectural production where everything is so fastidiously made and so perfected, right, that it's painted because it really doesn't care about the, it's not about the act of making, it's the act of what it is. So it can be non-material. It's anti-chromophobic, which is kind of an architectural condition that a lot of people seem to have, where color is something they can't handle. So I think it pushes ways of thinking building on all the things you mentioned, that it actually is a reaction to it. I think, I think the point is it's, it, it really is an argument, mm -hmm. a polemical argument, whether it's an instinct, because it's, it's like a manifesto, it seems to me. It's, 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 it disputes everything which is a contemporary priority, everything right down the line. Mm -hmm. And and I think in in that sense it's it's worth talking about as a way of as a way of thinking. What I would like to see, maybe we can figure out how to do one, 
is how you build a building with that argument. In other words, it's, as long as you're screwing around, with it, as long as you're working on installations and tables and wall hangings, it's one thing. But if you have to put it out in the parking lot and say, okay, this is where we're gonna graduate so it can't fall down and it has other kinds of obligations that are not just theoretical arguments. In other words, how would you build those houses? one of those houses in order to sustain the, the, the point of view that, that, that we're talking about. But I, I think it's, it's, it's very unusual, actually, and, it, 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 uh, and I don't think it gets credit for, I think it's, I think it's ascribed to, to very different interests. And I think, I think uh, uh, and the essay I read, you know, I read what everybody wrote, and I didn't really go into any of those things. This is what's going on. This is what Florencia thinks. 3D printing, and even this sort of hero, heroine architect of a certain kind of building. I don't say that facetiously, maybe self-consciously. And it, 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 it does away with that. And all of the other trappings of technique and technology while using them at the same time. And if it makes space, it makes space by building up. It's, it's like a topo map to make space, you know, stacking up pieces instead of, you know, la cucaracha or something, whatever it is, <clears throat> you know. So um, that's all I got. <laughs> Anybody want to comment, question? We're all foreigners. <laughs> Why this is considered like architecture rather than a piece of art? Why do we have to analyze this? Like how the like were pointed out. What material would be this? How this could be? I feel like this is a piece of art. So it's in a sculpture, it's an horizontal sculpture. If I eliminate the legs, I can just put this vertically. You can do it anything you want. It's a puzzle. I, I, don't, I, I don't understand. Why, why we, we are analyzing this like a piece of architecture, when in a way, sure. I don't think it is. I always, I always say that I get that question a lot, but I, I always defend it from the point of view of architecture. I don't think that, I, I don't think it would work. I, I, I don't think that it answers the, some of the questions that, that art does to the objects. I don't mean that it's not influenced by art, which it is. I mean, there are a lot of artists and pieces and you know, sculptures that are of a huge influence. But I don't think that it follows that same discourse and neither it follows a kind of conversation with art. It follows a conversation with architecture. And I think that all of the things that Eric just mentioned, the, all the anti-things that he mentioned, are all anti-architecture, or there are all issues within the architectural discipline. The fact, the separation of the legs, uh, the fact, the kind of materiality, the look at new technologies, acknowledging them, using them, but somehow, uh, you know, going beyond, uh, if possible, abstracting them in a way. Uh, all those are things that uh, belong to that, the architectural discipline. So I think that if you, if you look at any sculpture, you put in a sculpture right next to it, you, will, you would see the huge differences. But on, on simple terms, it looks. It looks like a painting and so on. You know, similar materials that are used. A you know, professional painter actually painted it. Um, so, so, so I think I always defended it. I, I always argue this from that point of view of, of always addressing architectural problems. And then it's, you know, as Eric said, you know, ideally, and if you look at some of the images on the screen, these are all tested in the architectural scale, you know, in larger projects, in housing projects, in, you know, competitions or museums. And you will see the similarities, you know. There's, there many times they go one to one. They like, that's why I was saying the scale for me is an interesting problem because it tries to avoid architectural issues such as long-standing issues of fixed typologies or, you know, kind of a given uh, elements within the architectural discipline. So I, I think that, you know, if, if, you, if you question or analyze it within all those issues, you know, 
you would, you would see that it's not art. And then the minute that I try to sell it, you will know for sure it's not art. <laughs> but also, that's, that's a good point, because within the show, it was a square gallery. There was a monitor, a big monitor, with 18 projects looped. So the architecture was relegated to a monitor. Everything in the room was not architecturally based. But when you're looking at this, then you, you would see um, the proposal for downtown LA, which is this concept at a bigger scale as a city organizer with building forms that have nothing to do with these extrusions and actually are more related to Cronopius, these kind of voluptuous circular forms that were clustered. So you see from a scale of this size to a city. But you can't be voluptuous in two dimensions. Mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, I think it's a, it's a very different definition of voluptuous. I think the in, in the context are voluptuous. I mean maybe, Rubens maybe were but the shapes that's true. Yeah. But that's two dimensions but 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 shown in in perspective as volumetric, whereas this thing is only right. volumetric in a very different way. It doesn't make volumes right. This, it, does, it, it never go, curves anything in yeah. this direction, legs aside. But it it's curves not everything only right. in this direction. That's why it's not the city. It's at a different scale. Well, but we said it, it, it might be a city. I, I think that, that what we're looking at here has to do with, with ways of thinking about making shapes and spaces and the strategies that are related to that, and what the strategies are sitting on, what they love, what they hate, what preferences they show, and in many cases, whether the people who are advocating certain things understand what they're advocating, which doesn't mean they couldn't be very good at it, but we're also looking for meanings. And I think what, what you have here are a lot of very unusual ways of thinking about putting pieces together to make, because every time you build something, you build it out of small things. You put the small things together, and you get a big thing. That's how you build things. It's the only way you can build anything. So that's what this is. This puts small things together, and it makes bigger things. So the question is, for architecture, how do you do that? That makes it architecture. How do you put small things together to make larger things? What do you put together? In what way? For what reason? And so on and so on. So, I, to me, the, whatever else you want to say that it is, um, it's it's an architectural discussion, and 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 I think it needs to be talked about explicitly. In the terms that I'm talking about, I think belong very much to discussions, contemporary discussions of of, of architecture, whatever other. So that's I think that's that would be my answer to it. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's true that architecture is about putting smaller things together to make bigger things, but it's also for a lot of people a question of how you subdivide larger things into smaller ones. And I, I actually think it's probably at that telescoping, or that it, it's, tel it's telescoping in that direction that seems closer to, to Florencia's project here. But I, but I want to actually get into the mechanics of it a little bit, because I, I think architects have a really sort of lousy habit of talking about how they're how they like art or influenced by it but but don't aren't willing to kind of go further with how they're taking how they're how they're taking art seriously in their work. And I feel like Florencia is a, an incredible example of attempts to move past some of the easy ways artists architects use artists. And Warhol came up earlier. I think Warhol's a completely salient artist for Robert Venturi. I, and, and, and an artist, a lot of people, a lot of architects have liked since that. But in Venturi, you see the building becoming sign. In Warhol, you see the, the soup can becoming sign. And you see a cultural reciprocity in their project. And you could probably draw the same kind of parallel between Peter Eisenman and Saul Lewin. I think each or either of them might do the same. I, my question to Florencia is, as I look at it, this almost seems like a kind of compendia of post-pop. Uh, interests. Um, there's a lot, and in particular, actually, it's it's actually a local cultural project. When I look at the work, I mean, a lot of your your work to date spans between some of the questions that arose in super flat and a kind of reassessment of Japanese Japanese pop ten or fifteen years ago, 
and maybe something closer to what Paul McCarthy did last year in New York, and a development of a whole kind of strange and actually quite sculptural iconography based on Snow White or something, a way of reading <coughs> fairy tales. So my question is, I don't. What I what I love about the work is that it's no longer simply a transfer of pattern or shape or allusion to art we like into patterns and shapes of architecture we might be able to build top down or bottom up. But actually, I think I have spent the night trying to imagine, I tend to see almost everything you do in terms of your name, in terms of a kind of, in, in terms of not a, not a tracing, but a flowering of possibilities through one another. And it seems to me, looking at the work behind Eric as much as the work here, the different ways that you're moving into a third dimension, you've tested a lot of different variations there. And I wonder, just as a question, could you talk specifically about the passage from the installation here, from Pulse to this, and what you see as the major changes or discoveries you've made that would differentiate that time from this in your work? I, I would say that it's a reverse, uh, a, a little bit what uh, Eric has been pointing out, it becoming more 2D. You know, I think that there's an earlier expectation, even in the, the orange one here, where everything becomes a topography and it's a highly three-dimensional. And it had a, a delineation of some forms, but it has become more and more two-dimensional. And I see it's like going back more to Murakami. Um, um, but uh, without the, you know, um, but trying to kind of advance it and, and question it through architecture. But I think that it's like, it's, what I was saying earlier, it's really the conflict between the surface and the line. Uh, that earlier was more of a given. You know, you take the, surf, the line out of the surface, but here, you know, like as if you would take it from any, the, the geometry of the surface would bring you a lot of lines. But I think that now the delineation, the, the kind of 2D drawing became more and more, more evident. Uh, and I think that it's the conflict, and in this case, it's lining to the in two directions, you know, it kind of flips. You know, it was saying, like, the tables could, it's like a different process. It's like, you know, the horizontal one with a vertical project. Um, this one, I mean, this seems to actually take, one of the interesting kind of disciplines of this particular project is that you live with extrusion. You don't really uh -huh. fight it. There's the rounding of that particular project where things kind of nest in one another and in shallow relief there's curvature. There's no extrusion. The earlier don't have extrusion. Eric's point about the jigsaw puzzle seems particularly important there because the jigsaw, the way you emboss a pattern into a jigsaw, most jigsaws, unless they're actually made with a jigsaw, don't, aren't flat. But I guess my, my question, and I, well, look, I, this is the first time I've seen the proposal for MoMA for, PS, for PS1. And in PS1, it seems like you're going to be inhabiting that flat, that 2D is scaling and intersecting itself in a way that makes it, you're going to inhabit, the, inhabit it the way you, you'd, you'd inhabit a, uh, 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 well, it's become, the, the, the logic of the, Syrac, the first Syrac installation has become, uh, you know, has, has become architecturally scaled. So while it, I guess it seems to me like you're pitching the two into 3D more, more radically, not retreating the two. I, one thing that, that um, I think for people who, who do architecture as a way of living, there's, there are different, when I was talking about the puzzle thing, what I was talking about is more the immediacy of, of architecture as a puzzle or life as a puzzle or what transfer one could make between quizzical life and a role for that in architecture. I remember having an argument with Stern about that. He said, yeah, that's very interesting. Why should it be part of architecture? It is, 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 so it's less a question of, of a cataloging of associations that might be brought to bear as a historical argument I mean, I, for me, I, I always thought the Warhol stuff would, over a long period of time, and there's certainly very different opinions, is, is, is a trivial subject, name, brand, sell, promote, all of those kinds of things. I, I just never thought, I mean, it may be clever for Marilyn Monroe or Campbell's Soup, 
It depends what meanings you're looking for in, in, in the content of art and architecture. And the immediacy of this, of this regardless of other, other associations which are completely plausible, that it, that it makes fun of techniques. I mean, you can't take a 3D print like that and hand paint it. I mean, this is, this is almost in your face, that's, you know? I mean, that's true, but I think pop art in general has that stance towards like, the manly, predictable structure. Maybe pop art, but in the, context, in the context of people talking about lionizing 3D printing and the way 3D printing is used now to make guns and hearts and all kinds of, which is not to say not fascinating, and the way models are so often presented, that, that the decision to hand paint it in the context of a school of architecture, in the context of an advocacy of that kind of tool, which most often manifests itself in a very particular way. And that's all over this thing, in, 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 terms, of, uh, in terms of dislocating the meanings of, of, of tile, let's say. Is it wood, is it plastic, whatever it is, I have it synthetic. Here, it weirdly became canvas, I think. Or the legs. I mean, look at the legs. Um, which are a kind of, a, kind of a, a piece of a cornice, you know, somewhere. And, and I think that's a very, very unusual, given the last, if you, if you want to go back to the sort of librarian's analysis of what happened and who advocated what, it's, it's certainly an unusual way to look at the question of, of support. I mean, you just look at, go out in a, a parking lot for the last three years and you'll see Alexis and you'll see Jenny and, and, and Dwayne and you'll see uh, Georgina and Marcelo and, and all of that. And I mean, look at this. It's completely antithetical to all of that stuff. There's no question about it. So just in the contemporary context, and I, th I think that's part of its its argument, and I, I, I don't think it's argued the way I would argue it if I were to do something like that. I think it's, it's argued in a much more self-effacing, wouldn't quite say ah shucks, but close to ah shucks way. And, and, but, it, but, but there's, a lot of, there's a lot of poignancy to that argument. You don't see it. And it, what, what you have to see now is somebody's gotta build it somewhere. Like, okay, go do the graduation pavilion or something. How would that translate into that kind of, you know, because we don't know how Florencia is going to do that, you know? So I just wanted to mention that Erin there, she just spoke, she literally draw the pattern of this table and the chronopius on the wall, so uh, much questions can be brought to her uh, as well. Uh, so thank you for your help. Um, I, with that, I wanted to go back to something uh, that Joe said, that men he mentioned about um, Paul McCarthy um, the, and his latest work. He did it like some, some park here in California. And he created this whole really strange narrative of the Snow White characters. And, uh, and I think in a way what is interesting, uh, a little bit obscure in that case, you know, uh, is that it, it would be the, the idea of using characters of moving beyond uh, a kind of a type, you know? Like it's, it's really, he's using Snow White, but he's using it as a, 
as a medium to tell some other stories, but you have to, in a way, recognize, you know, he has, uh, you know, he has every element from the, from the original story, and he replaced them in a very different way. But, you know, he, he, he kind of needs to keep on that narrative. I think that in the way that I'm interested in the notion of character is that it starts to give a certain personality to the items uh, without not necessarily having to deal with um, more conceptual, you know, uh, responses to some of the elements, you know. So it, it's almost as if, you know, in the Alice and the earlier works, um, they have a, a particular narrative within themselves, uh, the way that they go together, the way that they play, you know, similarly to that, and always taking on something that belongs to culture, you know. Like, uh, Snow White belongs to culture. He's taking it um, away from there and revisiting it. So I would say that that's with character, I guess it's relevant. Okay. Thanks very much to you. Thanks to Joe for his support. And uh, thank you for coming and have a nice evening. <laughs>